Now we are going to move to the second, the session number two, which is the implementation of joint risk assessment. And you have seen the principle, uh, uh, principles. Now we're going to the uh, implementation uh, itself. And we, we have three eminent speakers with us, Dr. Mark Nanying and Dr. Sandy Matama and Dr. Joanna Takinen. Dr. Mark uh, Nanying is one health uh, officer. He worked for uh, FAO, ECTAD especially, which he stands for uh, Emergency Center for Transboundary Animal Diseases. That's ECTAD. He is based in Kenya. We work together and uh, is an epidemiologist, uh, infectious disease epidemiologist. He provided technical support on the implementation of One Health uh, approach in, uh, in Kenya and elsewhere, because uh, we, we support the countries together in terms of implementing the One Health approach by operationalizing the two various tool, the multi-sectoral coordination mechanism tool, the joint risk assessment tool and surveillance information sharing tool. These three tools are available uh, to you. Now, and uh, he, Mark is involved in uh, uh, the, the epidemiology, field epidemiology training and is a member of uh, Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. He is a research fellow as well in, at the University of Liverpool. And the next speaker will be Dr. Sandy Makama, uh, who is a veterinarian and toxicologist with the link to really uh, the, the Dr. Armand just uh, presented. But uh, so uh, Dr. Makama works at the, the National Veterinary Research Institute and uh, he is a member as well of the National One Health Technical Committee and One Health Risk Surveillance and Information Sharing. So a technical expert on National Codex Almentarius Committee and member as well of the International Federation of Biosafety Association, which uh, really welcome to you. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we have to work together in the future. And uh, Dr. Joanna Takinen has been working at the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC, as an expert since 2005. We have seen the excellent work in terms of risk, uh, in terms of risk assessment when it comes to COVID. And uh, so since between 2006 and 2019, she, she has worked as the head of program for food and waterborne diseases and zoonosis, contributing to the setup and development of the European Union level surveillance of infectious disease. So we have a lot to, to learn from uh, from her as well. And she's been coordinating now the European Food and uh, Waterborne Disease and Zoonosis Network, which is FWDNet since January 2020. And she is developing the working group, uh, uh, all those uh, WGS enhanced responses to food and waterborne diseases. I think she can elaborate the methodology of how this is done. So I will uh, stop here, but she's uh, eminent uh, in uh, terms of, uh, she's a famous in working on uh, environmental and uh, laboratory context as well. Okay, now we're gonna move to Dr. Mark and uh, you're gonna talk about the, it, sorry, I got to someone uh, at the window. Yeah, uh, we're gonna talk about, you're gonna talk about implementing joint risk assessment. Please, over to you, Mark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tiable. I hope you can hear me so that I proceed. Yes, please. Over to you. Thank you. Okay. I'm just having some uh, technology issues. Um, okay. So, so my name is Mark. Um, and uh, thanks, Tiable, for giving uh, such an elaborate introduction of myself and my co speaker. Um, so what I want to demonstrate here is uh, the milestones that my country has made actually in utilizing uh, the Trapetite uh, JRA tool 
um, in terms of uh, uh, managing uh, zoonotic diseases of priority. So in um, 2015, we prioritized uh, uh, a number of diseases. Uh, we had a list of about 39, but Kenya is focusing on the, about five priority diseases. And this include the, the human African trypanosomiasis, brucellosis, anthrax, rift valley fever, and others. And the reason why this is very important to demonstrate this is that um, uh, how do we operationalize One Health? So we need a basis where we begin from. And first, after this, the semi-quantitative pressurization tool, we identify these diseases. And the next step, um, which has been um, a very seamless process of support from the trapetite working very closely with the zoonotic disease unit, uh, which is the national One Health platform in Kenya, which coordinates actually uh, uh, implementation of One Health and organization at the national and the subnational level. <laughs> We've been able actually to pilot uh, the JRA tool that uh, Ryan had just uh, uh, talked about. And we have been able actually to conduct also a training of national facilitators at a, at a national level. The reason why I'm showing this is that uh, the JRA tool and the MCM tool, which we just published actually in June uh, this year, they are interlinked together with the, the SIST tool, which is the, the surveillance tool. And from this framework, you realize that uh, the activities are cascaded down to the sub-national level, which we call the count one health units. But then as the trapetite, we are continuing actually to build upon this framework to develop more tools on risk reduction and risk communication because all of these are tied together. But more importantly is uh, how do we do this in a country? So in Kenya, we actually have a process where we want to bridge the gap between the animal health services and the public health services. And among the key areas in what we call the IHR and PVS that we are able actually to develop a, a uh, a joint roadmap and an action plan where um, we have identified uh, creating frameworks for joint risk analysis as a very key priority for the country, but also we have along a continuum of other processes to end this with communicating and having a feedback to the community. But more importantly, how to coordinate this is that a number of experts actually came up uh, early and mid part of this year and convened actually to develop an action plan for the multi-sectoral coordination mechanism. And in this mechanism, you can see clearly that we are aiming to build the capacity of the community health volunteers and the community disease reporters. These are the foot soldiers at the front line at the lowest levels of public health and animal health service delivery in Kenya at the sub-national level. And more importantly, the other action plan will actually to see on how this risk can be optimized so that it reaches the, the target uh, people properly. But then how do we do this? So we do this by actually creating um, um, a very robust kind of a coordination mechanism where um, the Minister of Health on, on the right side through the, uh, the Epidemic Response Unit and the Veterinary Unit at the Department of Veterinary Services, uh, we have this steering committee. And the, the purpose of this steering committee is actually to convene meetings in anticipation of probably an outbreak of probably it will be an epidemic or an emerging disease of concern to the country in terms of economy and public health hazards. But then um, they don't work in isolation. The National Steering Committee actually is responsible for appointing what we call the technical leads. Technical leads are subject matter experts uh, who have public health uh, training, veterinary epidemiology and environmental aspects. And we identified three priority diseases. This is Rift Valley fever, anthrax, rabies, and also we have ambitions actually to do for brucellosis and others as the way they appear on our priority list. The trapetite and many other uh, stakeholders actually play an advisory role and a technical backstopping on this uh, so that um, when we have actually the technical teams that are composed actually of now the, the you know, the, the, the hardcore scientists from research institutions, um, uh, from universities who actually provide evidence and options actually to the National Steering Committee to make decisions and policy issues. So we have successfully actually undertaken the piloting in 2019. And in 2021, actually we did our, our JRA training, which I'll illustrate. And we also able actually during the pandemic actually to use the JRA tool 
actually to assess uh, the potential spillover of COVID-19 from the animals to humans and vice versa. So this is just an illustration of how the coordination is done. But then when we choose a disease, for example, Rift Valley fever, which is a vector-borne disease and is an endemic disease in Kenya, it has occurred uh, since 1912 in Kenya, and more recently, actually, even in 2021, we want to ask ourselves, then how do we actually identify this as, um, as a risk? So in terms of risk framing, uh, and, and I think Professor Dillis Morgan actually presented on the, on the general aspects of risk, risk framing, there are various questions and concerns that our country is addressing. For example, we are having reported deaths of people or animals in specific areas. Uh, we don't really know if they are vaccinated or not. And also we are having new emerging areas of disease. So then we have this steering committee, which is a technical uh, team that comes together, uh, both from the, the livestock um, and the human health, and, and sometimes on need basis, the environmental uh, you know, you know, sector coming together to establish actually a coordinating uh, 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 team that will be responsible actually to assess and mitigate against this disease. And their triapatite or quadrapatite and many other media organizations come in actually to share these findings or to share this information to the public as a terms of feedback mechanism. So the example I'm going to use is Rift Valley fever, which is a classical uh, zoonotic disease that uh, has frequent outbreaks in Kenya. And when you're doing this, you have to follow the basic epidemiological you know, principles. Or if you are an investigator, you are a foot soldier that you want there, you are, you are going out there to find pathogens, you have to ask yourselves, of, what are you looking for? Where is this found? When did this happen? And probably how do we you know, find it? So using this principle of any other viral hemorrhagic fever, even today we are talking about uh, the Ebola you know, viral disease, we can be able actually to hypothesize using a qualitative approach but we want actually to move ahead and, and be able actually to conduct um, uh, sort of uh, quantitative uh, aspects where we can ask ourselves using Nyandaru as an example in Kenya, that what is the likelihood and the impact of this disease occurring and how will it affect the trend? And this is what actually Professor uh, Dylan was explaining. And this is what we've done. So um, using Nyandaru as a case study and using Kenya at a country level, there is a risk of actually a pathogen being imported into a country through the cross border. Let's say this is the, an aeroplane coming in or somebody walking across the Kenyan border coming into the country. So once the pathogen has been introduced in the country, then there's a risk of it actually going up to the county level, which is Nyandaro, where we choose, we've chosen as a low endemic region. But the most important pathway where we want to find the most significant pathway, it will be the pathway where the spillover potential occurs. And this is where you now deploy the JRA tool. The JRA tool is not always deployed until there is actually a demonstration of evidence of spillage of you know, infections from humans to animals. Before that, the sector specific risk assessment protocols are actually employed actually to assess this. So this is a, an example where this is where now you deploy your JRA tool. And quickly, um, once you have the subject matter experts in the house, they will be able actually to review historical occurrence of the disease, look at the epidemiological patterns of how the disease has been shifting. To give you the certainty, seroprevalence studies are very important where we want to see probably the circulating virus or antibodies in both humans and animals. And if we have this evidence, using actually uh, an enhanced uh, early warning system or a surveillance system, looking at all the parameters from environmental issues to water issues to mosquitoes and such, and then we can score that there's a likelihood actually for this disease to occur. When you come to the impact, the impact actually just goes beyond trade, trade and, and economic issues. There are issues of food insecurity coming up or probably even human death. So according to the last uh, risk assessment that we did for Nyandarwa, um, we actually recommended uh, actually to deploy uh, an enhanced surveillance system because we found out that there was a moderate impact but there's also a moderate light likelihood of the disease to occur. So when this moves up to here, where there's a very high likelihood and also severe impact of the disease, then that means that the situation is very grave. And therefore you have actually to move quickly to deploy whether there are vaccine stockpiles, whether there are any other countermeasures, any medical countermeasures that you're going to put uh, into, into, into place. And after you've done all that, because it's a, it's a long 10 step process actually to do that, then you want actually now to move ahead and actually communicate back to the decision makers. The decision makers will be um, 
the policy makers at the national level and the sub-national level, uh, you want actually to provide advisory issues. For example, if you're looking at an, uh, 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 a viral hemorrhagic fever that presents as an acute febrile illness in humans, then probably we want to see the facilities, what they have been doing. Um, we want to actually use forecasting tools actually to do epidemiological modeling and, and risk mapping to identify those hotspots. But more importantly, research is very important whereby uh, there are a number of teams which go down there on their boots and actually collect data, do genomic surveillance and try to understand actually the, the whole actually pattern of how these diseases are, are spreading across the, uh, the, the country. And optimization of diagnostic you know, algorithms is also very key to do that. So if we have this evidence, we have also been able actually to do what we call the CMEX and the AIR, and I'll actually show that on how this, this is connected actually to this, because it helps actually for the decision makers to have evidence of presence of the, the, the virus or something, and then to make a decision on that. So when you enhance this, you sensitize the community, and the community can be sensitized actually through accurate reporting by mainstream media and many other channels from the, from the, tra from the trapezoid. A very good example is the 2018 Rift Valley fever outbreak, which was reported actually by the OIE then and WHO and all these other agencies. And when Rift Valley fever was actually restricted in Garissa, we have seen the potential of actually the epidemiological shift to other areas in, in, in Kenya. So risk mapping actually helps us to move ahead and ask ourselves that in 2021, then we have other areas emerging, which are actually either overlaying on the, on the previous you know, risk, or probably these are new areas. So the case of Isiolo, which is a classical case where the, the tool Hello, has Mark, been actually Mark, deployed. Mark, Mark, please uh, wrap it up. Thank you. And we need okay, to go thank on. you. Yeah, actually, this is the last slide. Um, so for example, for Isiolo, when we have this you know, you know, coming up, we have seen actually veterinary and human uh, uh, you know, epidemiologists come into place and actually provide good data sets that are able actually to help the country to make these decisions. And we are continuing to conduct research to provide evidence. At the same time, we are using tools that can be able to predict disease in near real time to give us with more precision of where the next epidemics are going to occur and where the highest risk is. And by conducting simulation exercises, we are able actually to assess our risk pre 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 precisely. And we are planning now in the next two weeks to conduct more simulation exercises of, on Ebola and others using the same frameworks that have been established by uh, the JRA tool. And finally, we can tell our communities by providing policy frameworks, by providing brief tools that can change the behavior in terms of how well to respond to epidemics or probably how the community actually can assist in actually assessing risk and managing risk at the same time. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. This is really great presentation outlining uh, how uh, the tool is used and how the various to complement each other. Now we will move to the next uh, uh, presentation without uh, delaying. Uh, Dr. Sa Sunday Makama, over to you, please. Great, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And I quickly recognize my uh, previous uh, speakers who have beautifully laid the foundation for me. And I hope that I will be able to give this story in as brief a time and as quickly as possible. Uh, so essentially, I will be uh, speaking on um, anthrax, and I would like to quickly engage with uh, the audience just to make sure that we are together. Could you quickly type in the in the chat box uh, the answer to this? Zoonotic diseases require a joint uh, approach to risk assessment. True or false? Uh, obviously, if you have been here for a while, you will agree with me that the answer is true, and. Uh, the approach to conducting a joint risk assessment uh, as deployed or as recommended in the GRA operational tool, uh, it's qualitative or quantitative? A or B? Aha, excellent, excellent. It means that uh, we are together. So that makes my story uh, quite uh, easy to, to be able to speak on. So essentially, we have heard from the previous speakers how, for example, disease prioritization resulted in the convening of a joint risk assessment, as was the case that Mark just described. But also other times, if you have a risk surveillance information group or a system or a structure that works, alerts could be picked up. And that was the case for Nigeria with respect to anthrax. 
because there was a report uh, that came out sometime in May that you know indicated that there were outbreaks of uh, anthrax in Eastern and Western Africa, and that became a source of concern. And as we know, anthrax is quite a deadly um, uh, disease, and should it uh, spread, it could really cause a lot of problems. So this is one other uh, incidence where the need for this joint risk assessment uh, becomes evident. And why? Because anthrax is a zoonosis, and therefore it is crucial that we have a holistic understanding of what was unfolding in order to be able to advise um, uh, mitigation steps for risk management and communication. And key amongst the government concerns related relating to these hazards are the issue of the possibility of transborder um, spread and also particularly the ignorance of farmers and the populace, including even healthcare workers in identifying this type of disease since it has, it's no longer a very common disease and likelihood of missing it is high. And also we are worried because our borders are not as uh, rigid or tight as they ought to be, and it's, there's a great chance that uh, this disease could travel. So quickly remember, again, in the operational tool, it has been built in such a simple way and a systematic approach involving 10 steps uh, that involves also um, components or steps that are either required or recommended. Uh, essentially, I'll be speaking on a number of them and why that is so, because in the first uh, step and the fourth step, sometimes the situation at hand will not allow you or will not necessitate you to do that, either because you already have an existing structure in place that you will work with, or there is not enough time, especially as Professor Dillis alluded to when we have to do such a rapid risk assessment. But essentially, these are the 10 steps. And usually the, um, uh, the operational tool is set out in a way that it color codes uh, most of the steps to be able to make it easy for you to use. So in our case, we, now, we have now a situation that has uh, resulted in the need for a joint risk assessment. So if we're gonna go step by step, for example, in Nigeria, we have a functional One Health Steering Committee that sort of coordinates most of the activities that involve the Trapatite Ministries of Agriculture, Environment and Health, and all other stakeholders within the One Health uh, community. So essentially there was no need to set it up again. Uh, we already have it in place, so all we need to do is to deploy. And of course, going by the tool, a JRA lead for the anthrax uh, joint risk assessment was now designated, and a team of experts and all key stakeholders were conveyed onto a physical meeting. And of course, we already have our stakeholders mapped, so there was no need to, to do that. Next in the step of what we need to do then is to be able to have a clear uh, risk framing, which guides the JRA technical process and particularly helps with the formulation of risk assessment questions. Because when you are going to be doing your risk assessment, you are going to be specifically dealing with key questions that would have emanated from the risk framing that was done, usually by the steering committee, with of course the support of the JRA uh, technical lead. So in three key things that are involved in the risk framing are the hazard, the scope, and then the purpose and objectives. So in our case, the hazard is already identified, anthrax uh, caused by bacillus anthracis, and of course the scope, um, had to do with the risks at the human animal environment interface. And for the concern of government, particularly at the border, international and national borders, how this is, uh, could play out and what they need to do to be able to mitigate or communicate uh, this risk uh, appropriately to those that are concerned. And the purpose was for risk mitigation. And then the objective is to be able to provide basis for management or communication uh, decisions. Next in that step is if you have been able to uh, frame your risk, then you need to diagram the risk pathways. And this is essential, this is key because your ability to understand all the likely potential exposure routes or sources as it affects the three animal environment and interface will help you to think about as much as possible, every possible scenario that can play out in terms of exposure and in terms of 
the impact that could come from such exposure. And at this stage, you are advised usually, and that is the whole key, to think as wide as necessary to contribute to your understanding of the evolution or epidemiology of the disease, but also to be careful not to get too sidetracked away from the focus of what the risk training uh, you know, points to. Because several questions could arise from such a diagram. And the idea of putting out these pathways is to be able to help you to look at the critical points where this risk or the potential for this threat, you know, can result in the heaviest impact and be able to quickly um, advise, or to be able to pass your recommendation as a technical team onto the steering committee who will deal with the management of the risk as well as to communicate to stakeholders appropriately. So sometimes you could start with a lot of sketches as you see on the, on the left, and you could go through many iterations of it within the technical uh, meeting where you diagram and draw out all the possible pathways. And in the end, you are able to, uh, if you get around to it, come, come around to a cleaner sheet that you can use to com uh, communicate with your uh, steering committee. It is important that you consider all the potential risk pathways and uh, because it helps informing you. So in this case, I will quickly just show you two examples because I'm going to be walking through all these steps and these questions arise from the risk diagram that you've been able to pathway. Now, I show you two examples of questions that we looked at when we are considering the issue of anthrax in Nigeria. And again, the questions are framed in a, a systematic way and in logical uh, format as described within the GRA operational tool. And they usually take this format of what is the likelihood and impact of, you know, in this case now we say at least one person. Um, let me just quickly move this. At least one person in a local government with international borders to be infected with anthrax from live animals that are crossing the border within the next six months. Now, another question is the likelihood and impact of at least one abattoir worker now in a Nigerian state with international borders becoming infected with anthrax from an infected animal within the next six months. Now, I take my time to read this out because you could have several risk questions that you need to document. And for the tool to work best for you, you need to keep in mind that for each of these questions, you need to carry out its own assessment. You need to characterize it individually. So the idea is that you do not lump, if you have five questions, you do not lump them all together when you are doing the risk characterization. So for each one of these, the next step for you to be able to deal with has then to do with the risk characterization. And in our case, our experience was that after conducting this, we concluded uh, from the assessment that for both questions one and two, you have a high likelihood uh, of occurrence and the impact uh, was considered to be moderate in both cases. Now, during the time that Professor Gillis was speaking about um, so an additional component of this uh, estimate is that we need to keep in mind the uncertainty. How confident are we regarding the outcome of our estimates? And for this, you also need to um, give your uh, uncertainty or your confidence level for each of the likelihood and the impact of either question that you are dealing with or as many of the questions that you're gonna be dealing with. And for that, maybe I throw in a word of caution to say, uh, be advised not to take, tackle so many questions that, that do not address the concerns that are at hand or do not address potentially the threat that you are worried about based on what you have used both data, expert opinion and expert knowledge and all the necessary information about the disease that you do know, be able to diagram the risk pathways. Now, again, the tool is, is designed with coloration to help us with the next steps, which is to be able to advise or make recommendation as to management options or the communication strategies. So usually if you find yourself within the red zone, it speaks of the need for critical implementation 
of mitigation measures, and that involves a lot of increased surveillance as well. If you fall within the yellow zone, you need to review and adjust mitigation measures, perhaps that are already existing, and be able to do a targeted or you know surveillance that is linked with uh, the activities of around the disease at the time. And if you are within the green zone, then it doesn't mean that you do nothing. Rather, you maintain your current surveillance uh, strategy or disease control measures that are already in place. So in our case, we adjudge that the um, likelihood and impact in both cases happen to be uh, high and moderate. So I throw in this um, table to quickly just give us an idea of how the process also should work. So for example, in the first question that we're dealing with, after dealing with the characterization of the risk as you know, both likelihood and impact, and then judging it to be high or and moderate, you need to also provide rationale behind your decision because that also supports your estimate of uncertainty or how you judge your confidence level. And usually when you- Dr. Makama, judge... Dr. Yes. Makama, please wrap up, please. Yes, thank yes, you. thank you, almost there. So, and then you provide a technical interpretation for the steering committee. And in this case, our technical interpretation, you know, suggests that uh, what I just shared, but more importantly, you provide the recommendation which involves the need for active surveillance for anthrax at border states, increased risk communication, capacity building, mass vaccination uh, with devices that, that do exist. And then of course you inform the stakeholders. But more importantly also, you document this risk assessment and be able to get all the stakeholders to sign off on it so that you are able to do this. In our case, we had the experience of these four key factors, political with relevant sector engagement, risk assessment capacity, thanks to the trainings we received uh, from the Public Health England, UK, HSA, and all other partners, and then access to information that enabled us to do this. Thank you so much. I know it has been quite a blast but we are happy to take your questions at the appropriate time and feel free to contact us when you do need them. Thank you very much. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Makama. This is great. And I'm happy that you operationalized the tool in Nigeria and you had a several workshops with Professor Dilip and colleague as well. Now, we're going to move to uh, the third speaker, Dr. Johanna Takinen. Uh, we, we have introduced her already. Uh, Dr. Johanna Takinen, please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the opportunity to present you some concrete example on how we in the EU perform joint ECDC EFSA rapid risk assessments on cross-border foodborne outbreaks. I try to get this. Yes, now it's, it's uh, clear. So first of all, very shortly, ECDC is a decentralized agency of the European Union, which became operational in 2005. And we work under mandate of three legislations. First is regulation from 2004. Then there's decision on serious cross-border threats to health from 2013. And these two pieces of legislation are currently under revision at the very final stages. So then the third one is decision on diseases under surveillance and relevant case definitions. And under these uh, legislation pieces, we work on surveillance of 56 diseases, infectious diseases, and also special health issues like AMR, we also host an early warning and response system, which is managed by the Commission. And we perform public health risk assessments, uh, and we also monitor different threats 24-7. And then also work with countries towards preparedness and response planning. So now I will give you a concrete example how we collaborate with the food sector. So we work in the public health sector and it's quite important to identify your stakeholders and also then the net related networks and develop the collaboration with them. So ECDC coordinates a food and waterborne diseases network which consists of uh, epidemiologists and microbiologists in uh, all EU EA countries. EPSA, the European Food Safety Authority, is located in Parma, Italy, 
and also coordinates a network of uh, experts in journalist data collection. Uh, then there is a health security unit in the Commission, which manages the EWR system, like I mentioned, and that is located in Luxembourg. And then there is another unit uh, coordinating the food safety issues, and that is a Commission unit in Brussels, in Belgium, also coordinating a RAS system, which is rapid alert system for food and feed. In addition to these, we collaborate also with five networks of laboratories, which are European Union reference laboratories for Campylobacter, foodborne viruses in Sweden, both located in Sweden, also URL for Salmonella in the Netherlands, URL for VTEC in Italy, and also URL for Listeria monocytogenes in France. And these are veterinary reference laboratory networks. Then it's quite important that uh, to distinguish the concepts of risk assessment and risk management. And for that purpose, we have two different platforms. The EpiPulse platform is uh, the purpose of this platform is to perform risk assessments. In this platform, countries can open and share information about national events, which they think could have a EU-wide dimension, and they can share information uh, with other countries. Similarly, EWRS, which is the management, risk management platform between the competent public health authorities and managed by the commission, uh, but hosted by ECDC. Then this EpiPulse platform, its uh, notification by the countries is on voluntary basis, whereas it's mandatory in EWRS based on this decision 1082. In EpiPulse, the type of notification is informal, but it's formal in EWRS. And the participants in EpiPulse systems are all these disease public health function networks experts, like I mentioned, from different public health institutes and national reference laboratories. In EWRS, this is a platform for public health competent authorities and policy makers, which come from ministries of health and the European Commission. So in these uh, rapid risk assessments together with EFSA, when the countries report a national event, when it becomes and turns out to be a multi-country event, which is often defined on the basis of microbiological information, particularly uh, whole genome sequencing, that confirms that the strains that causes the disease are very likely originating from a common source. So the different criteria that influences on our decision on what kind of rapid risk assessment output we start to work on are, for example, how rapidly this uh, outbreak is evolving, how many countries are involved, and what are the number of cases in different countries, how severe is the outbreak, are there many hospitalizations, are there deaths reported, and what kind of suspicion of food is there? Is it the food type with long shelf life? Is it possibly traded across countries? If there is a media interest, that can also influence on our decision on starting to work on a joint risk assessment. Or also if we need to inform general public or only risk managers. And in that case, we prepare a joint notification summary with the aim to immediately notify risk managers of a cross-border foodborne risk. And here we summarize all available information. And this summary is restricted, distributed, restrictively distributed to risk managers only in this RAS system and also in EWRS. If instead we decide that there is a need to inform general public, we start to produce this, uh, prepare the joint rapid outbreak assessment. And here we often start active data collection from the countries 
We perform then joint analysis and we have a very agreed procedure for this. And all these rapid outbreak assessments will be then published on both agencies' websites. So now I show you a little bit how all these different stakeholders are interconnected. So first of all, we have weekly teleconferences with EFSA, and there we review all different ongoing multi-country outbreaks, and we discuss on what could be the next steps and if we should start to embark on any joint risk assessments. Then EFSA liaises with the European Commission's Food Hygiene Unit and ECDC liaises with the Health Security Unit in the Commission. And then EFSA also liaises with the European Union Reference Laboratories, which in turn coordinate national reference laboratories. And EFSA also liaises with the RASP, and, uh, which is also a network of national food safety authorities. And then ECDC coordinates this uh, FWD net, national public health institutes and national public health laboratories experts. Of course, at the national level, there is a various level of collaboration across sectors and also between countries. So often the signal of something uh, occurring in the EU EEA comes from this EpiPulse, this informal risk assessment platform. A country opens an event and informs that there is an unusual in, uh, cases of specific disease, let's say salmonella or listeria or estec particularly, and that becomes a multi-country event. Then ECDC and uh, EFSA initiate data collection and uh, we perform also centralized WGS whole genome sequencing analysis uh, based on information collected from isolates, also from humans and animals, food, feed and environment. And we also uh, produce EPI summary and EFSA performs traceback and forward analysis based on information shared by the countries in the RASP system. And when all that is done, we publish this joint rapid outbreak assessment. And often this whole process uh, takes about uh, one and a half months, max two months, because there's this active data collection from countries. We are not working in silo. So also EFSA liaises with FDA US and ECDC has links to PulseNet International. And there are also non-EU EA EPIPALS users in, in certain countries. And finally, European Commission uh, Food Hygiene Unit is responsible for communication with InfoSan. Then I just give you a, uh, an example of a multi-country outbreak of Salmonella Branderup, which was linked to imported melons last year. It was opened by Denmark on 3rd of May. And uh, this created uh, quite extensive uh, investigation between the countries and ECDs helped in coordination of this. There were over 350 cases in 12 EUA countries and the United Kingdom. You can see here the epic curve. So it was really rapidly evolving. There were six dead hospitalizations, but no deaths were reported. Luckily, UK was able to test that two samples of Kalia melons imported from Honduras tested positive with the outbreak strain. And it's quite important here to notice that the, this outbreak duration was about three months. And why is this important? It's important that if we want to act upon these uh, cross-border threats, uh, football threats, in a timely manner, we need to understand what is the realistic time we can do so. And this natural uh, development of this uh, outbreak was about three months. And that was simply because these imported melons were on the mark, EU market around that three months time period. And here you can see how this outbreak looked like towards us. So on 3rd of May, uh, Denmark opened this in Epi EPIS, which was the name of the EPIPALS at the time. And then we gradually started to see that there were more and more cases 
reported. And then here you can see when we published uh, the rapid outbreak assessment on 20th of July. So the epidemic looks very much different for us. And unless we have a chance, like we did here, we collected then case-based information from each country, and then we could see how this actually, this outbreak occurred. That was very shortly uh, the presentation, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. I have my colleagues in EFSA, ECDs, and also in the member states, of course, and the European Union Reference Laboratories to thank. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Joanna Takinen. Uh, you were on time. Uh, thank you very much for the brilliant presentation. We have uh, seen the three excellent presentations and previous presentation as well. And uh, before really, we would thank you all for participating to this uh, session. And uh, before moving to the next session, we will have five minutes uh, or less for questions. And we have seen some questions already uh, uh, the, in the chat box, the Q&A. But I, before giving a question, really, and uh, you have seen how important the communication is. But uh, perhaps uh, maybe Dilis, Professor Dilis Morgan didn't tell you that, but uh, and, uh, other speakers as well. And communication is very important in terms of uh, when it comes to risk. All the stages presented during for the risk assessment, communication is important between the risk assessor and decision makers, scientists, and the public. And it is important, it is the heart of it. And but what they didn't tell you is how important the communication is in terms of risk management itself. Yeah, because that's how it is. For example, we have a risk communicator. Uh, he will present uh, maybe uh, tomorrow, but you will see how it is important to pass the message. Passing the message, the right message can reduce the risk. It can contribute to it. And the other part is, it, because we do the risk assessment, it does mean we know better than the local community, and but it is, uh, better than the local farmers. Not at all, because all this can be biased with bias, but by taking their knowledge into account, it helps well, it helps very much. And so it needs to be incorporated into the risk, uh, the uh, into the risk communication as well. So uh, now uh, let's go for, uh, for a few questions. And uh, these were just the general uh, remark. Okay, now, a uh, question was asked, maybe Mark, if you can address this one publicly, I think you saw that question already. And we know that pathogen resistance and urbanization and the destruction of natural habitats increase the risk of zoonotic diseases. So what uh, probably maybe the person want to ask, what Africa CDC is doing to reduce the risk? That was, uh, if it's not clear, I would request the author, the author to come up and uh, you know, alive. And so what is the type of interdisciplinary collaboration which should be uh, implemented? And uh, I think uh, it is generally uh, that question uh, to Mark. And uh, for whoever want to uh, address that one, Dr. Takinen or Dr. Mark Kama, and how can we strengthen the surveillance system in event like World Cup uh, event to detect the vector born diseases? So these are the two questions. I put that uh, on table, but the rest we can look at that. Uh, we got only a few minutes. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mark. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tible. So uh, I think the question asked by the participants is very relevant because um, uh, we all know that um, when we coexist with the environment and we do not destroy the environment, then we keep those pathogens actually in the environment. At the moment when we have rapid uh, human activities, anthropogenic activities trying to exploit forest reserves, and a classic example probably of the origins of the, of the COVID pandemic or many other you know, animal you know, diseases that emerge from the forest, so the coming in of the, the UNEP into the quadrapetite actually has been an impetus to help the other members of the quadrapetite. 
not just to focus on the human animal uh, interface, but also to have uh, an ability to understand what happens in the environment. So I think not just African CDC, but all the you know, stakeholders who are involved in uh, issues of One Health and disease control, they are now paying more attention actually to the environment. And I think this has been stimulated by uh, the supposed you know, origins of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So I agree with the, with the comment given by, by Honorary. And uh, also we are working very closely actually with the env environmental uh, 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 experts to understand the environmental epidemiology that happens. The last question on the community health volunteers, I think I demonstrated on the sub-national level where the joint risk assessment is not just a domicile at the national level, but is now moving through what we call the count one health units and actually to try and, and train these frontline you know, healthcare workers at the lowest levels uh, down at the counties or the villages. So that's where we can actually customize these trainings to unpack them so that they are easily understood by the people who are volunteering on the front lines. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Mark. This is a brilliant uh, uh, answer and uh, collaboration is key. Collaboration, capacity building, communication, uh, really, the, uh, and coordination, they are key, the four C, and which are well uh, defined in the, uh, the, the new guideline for operational One Health, which the definition has been adopted by the high level panel for uh, expert of One Health in the world. Okay, now, the, the, yeah, Dr. Takne, you, you want to tackle? Uh, uh, the first question, uh, Dr. Makama, how can we strengthen the surveillance system in an event like World Cup, event to detect vector bomb diseases? I just got a message from Dr. Tekken and she might have to leave. I'm not sure. Oh, you are there. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. That, that's very good. Uh, the question is very good. As you know, vector bone diseases law have been done in it uh, to address vector bone diseases. And you, uh, the meteorological data have been used to predict it, and the vector densities have been used. So uh, for risk assessment to address it, it, really, we all work together and with the various tools you have seen, and a researcher, for example, uh, in the GDR tropical disease uh, research, uh, they have done a lot in terms of climate change and vector bone diseases. So the framework we developed, uh, we, we looked at it to evaluate. I think they are good example of it and uh, to, to, to predict even uh, when uh, these vector bone diseases can rise, especially we know uh, take uh, some of, uh, of them like uh, the Rift Valley fever, you, you, you take it, it is a vector bone disease, uh, whether you agree or not. And uh, uh, FAO and colleague, have addressed it in such way they can uh, they can map and you have seen that map uh, during a map pre uh, presentation and we are using those data even for early warning system and so early warning system mean a uh, multiple sector need to work together uh, meteorology climate change expert vector control uh, and animal health work and human, because that's how it, it, it works. So good example as uh, certain, I know uh, Dr. Bruce Wilcox has done uh, over 20 years, uh, or 30 years even works in Africa and Asia on, on this in supporting uh, member states as well and uh, WHO and all the partners, they, they have a really good guide, guideline uh, about it. So I will stop there. And uh, so without joint surveillance, it's impossible, impossible to control vector bone disease. So we, we, we address those ones. Yes. 